Hello, BookTube. It's Wednesday, and that's new comic book day, when hair-splitting him babies go to the their LCS, their local comic shop, uh, where they stand around reading instead of buying. And uh, despite the fact that the week started with a federal holiday, the comics were shipped on Wednesday, so th there were new issues at the comic store today. Uh, and the I, I briefly flirted, even on this channel, even in the course of Wednesday Comics, I briefly flirted with buying new release, uh, what they call floppies, new release single issue comics. Uh, I fell briefly under the spell of doing that, uh, thinking that that would just be the way that I would read comics. I wouldn't collect them in volumes anymore. But the comic book industry has progressed, I, wa I want to say matured, to the point where virtually every week there is an archival omnibus, a collection of some kind of older material that I really want, that I know I like, something that I have in single issues falling to dust here at Hyde Cottage, and that I would like to have in book form so that I continue to reread it until I fall to dust. <laughs> uh, and that that really is, it's, it's time for me to just acknowledge that my reading tastes in comics have changed. There isn't any ongoing weekly comic, you know, a weekly regular floppy issue, with the exception of the, uh, the Marvel Comics 2 Conan titles. So far, Conan the Barbarian and the Savage Sword of Conan are so good that I wouldn't want to miss an issue. But uh, aside from that, there's nothing that really that really pulls me to keep getting it month after month after month. So I have sort of reverted back to special single issues and otherwise some reprint volume. And there are so many of them. There's virtually one every week now. I, I don't usually have to go without. I remember when they were special occasions. They're not anymore. Uh, and... And my comic book visit today to my LCS, which was reopened, it's in a, a, a splashy gala new location. Two floors instead of one. Uh, just nicer in every way, and tons more product. It was kind of sad. My my local comic shop is a Newberry Comics. It is the one on Newberry Street. Uh, and... Uh, the, the shop, the chain, is called Newberry Comics, but in the new location... The new location has two floors instead of one, and the first floor has no comics on it at all. The comics are relegated to the very back corner of the second floor. Anyone looking, anyone knowing nothing about comics and nothing about Newberry Comics, just looking at the layout of the product in this store would come to the natural conclusion that comic books are the least important item in the inventory. The first floor is all tchotchkes and socks and... Funko Pops and whatnot. The second floor is almost all of the same, except for uh, the comics. And the two things that I got today are both Tales of True Believers. <laughs> and the first one is literally that, because Marvel Comics uh, recently started a True Believers line of $1 reprint issues, usually meant to bolster some big thing that they've got their eye on for that month, for instance, in the month when they were launched, when they were regaining the Conan properties and launching two $125 hardcover collected omnibus editions, in order to pump up interest for that among re a readership that was too young to remember those issues when they first came out in the 70s, they came out with a month full of Conan the Barbarian True Believer issues, some of which were fantastic reprints, all for a dollar. But some of them are things that I hadn't seen in 30 years. And for a dollar, that's painless. Uh, this month, their emphasis is on Captain Marvel, <laughs> because they're about to come out with uh, a movie, a, a Captain Marvel movie. Uh, and it, it, the Captain Marvel movie does not star, it does not feature Captain Marvel, the world's mightiest mortal, the uh, big red cheese, <laughs> the, the super-powered Superman clone who, who, who Billy Batson transforms into when he says the magic word Shazam. Marvel Comics 1 a legal a court battle, and so there is no Captain Marvel in DC, even though way long ago DC bought the rights to the Fawcett character of Captain Marvel and all the appurtenances there too. Uh, but it didn't matter. Uh, Marvel now owns the rights to the name Captain Marvel. So the Captain Marvel movie that's coming out in theaters does not star the transformed Billy Batson. Instead, in a wonderful bit of, of timing that would look, would look fake if you saw it in a novel, DC's Captain Marvel, Shazam, is coming out at roughly the same time. Two competing versions of Captain Marvel. I don't have a screener for Shazam. Uh, I have a screener for Captain Marvel. I have watched it once. Uh, I don't think it's going to do well, uh, at least comparatively speaking to Marvel Comics. I don't think it's going to be a home run. 
it's it's a bit of it's a bit on the dull side as a movie. But uh, I'm curious to know since I don't have a screener for the for Shazam for the DC Comics Captain Marvel. Uh, I don't know if the character is actually called Captain Marvel in the the course of the movie. There is no possible you you cannot copyright words, <laughs> a spoken conversation. You cannot copyright people in the movie could easily call the character at least Captain or the Captain. Otherwise, you have a superhero who can't say his own name, which is actually excuse me, which is actually the case in the relaunched Shazam comic book that DC recently launched. Uh, they recently did a have started up Shazam again. The first issue. I, the reason I didn't talk about it, I I read the first issue and it was just garbage just awful it had it had fantastic artwork but as a first issue it was an incomprehensible mess and in the course of that first issue captain marvel actually says to someone that he ha he cannot say his own name so he in the comics he is not called captain marvel anymore at all he is shazam is the word that he uses to get his powers but if he introduces himself he loses his powers <laughs> but anyway the upcoming marvel movie is not about billy batson <laughs> and it's also not about Captain Marvel, who was the character that the Marvel comics plastered that name on once they got the legal rights to it. They needed to come up with a character, and they came up with a a very dumb, derivative, poorly imagined, boring character, the kind of character that arises out of non-artistic reasons. If If Marvel comics had to create a Captain Marvel for legal reasons, this is exactly the sort of bland creation that you would expect. He's a Cree superhero, a, a, a member of a warrior, a military warrior race called the Kree from a distant galaxy. Uh, they are all blue, but Marvel is not blue. He's as pasty-faced as a human. And, and Mar when Marvel comes to Earth, he has kind of, sort of, superpowers. They're not Superman-level superpowers, but Earth, we're told that Earth's gravity is lighter than the gravity of the home planet of the Kree. Uh, never before seen that the, that any other Kree get superpowers when they come to Earth, and not not afterwards either. But but and and it just becomes a mess after that. Captain Marvel ends up having all sorts of technological gadgetries, wristbands that harness light, all sorts of stuff like that. It's ridiculous. Can he fly or can't he? I don't know. Uh, can, does he always have those bands on his wrists or not? I don't know. What do they do? I don't know. <laughs> it just it is ridiculous. Uh, and Marvel had to keep him because they had rights to the name, and if you don't use it, you lose it. Uh, so eventually, they decided to create uh, just to pull the beard of DC a little bit more. They decided to link Marvel with a character named Rick Jones, a teenager named Rick Jones, who was originally responsible for the Avengers forming and who was a longtime sidekick of the Incredible Hulk. He has no superpowers of his own, unless being annoying is a superpower. And I don't want to hear any comments. Okay, <laughs> uh, but in one in one uh, twist that uh, th those those wristbands suddenly uh, linked Marvel and Rick Jones, and when Rick Jones slams his wrists together, slams the bands together, he changes places with Marvel. Marvel is plucked out of the Phantom Zone and gains life on Earth for three hours, and then he goes back to the Phantom Zone, and Rick Jones comes back. So, in other words, a Marvel Comics ripoff of not only the name of the character, but also the gimmick of Shazam. In case you're getting the impression, I thought that Captain Marvel, Marvel's Captain Marvel, was a complete wash-up. The first issue was done in a... He didn't have a, a book of his own at first. The first issue was, was drawn by the great Gene Cullen, who was clearly didn't know what to do in the issue. Gene Cullen is usually a great craftsman and a fantastic... Draughtsman, someone who who can draw an issue of a comic book such that you do not need the writer, you don't need any word balloons. Not in his Captain Marvel. I believe the first appearance of Captain Marvel was also a True Believers issue last week or the week before that. And it, I would ordinarily have, have scooped it up. I'm you won't find a bigger fan of Gene Cullen's artwork than I. But uh, that issue was a mess, and so was all the rest of Captain Marvel. It was just a mess. He shined in two instances only. Later on, after he'd had dumb, one dumb adventure after another, uh, Roy Thomas, the writer Roy Thomas, decided to come up with, he came up with this idea for an intergalactic war that did not involve Earth, that where it had nothing to do with Earth, where it was between two space empires, the Kree and the shape-shifting Skrull. The Skrull had appeared in the Fantastic Four, and uh, Roy Thomas came up with the idea of these two empires fighting and the fight somehow overlapping to affect earth to affect the avengers 
It was called the Kree Skrull War, and it kicked off in the Avengers. And that was one of the ways in which the old Captain Marvel could be more bearable. As <laughs> when he was in the Kree Skrull War. Of course, he's a, he's a Kree who has made his alliances on Earth and who fights alongside the Avengers, so he becomes a crucial character. Uh, and the Kree Skrull War is a classic storyline in Marvel Comics. Uh, and Rick Jones has a wonderful role at the end of that. Much as I scorn the character of Rick Jones and the character of Captain Marvel, the ending of the Kree Skrull War is fantastic, just fantastic, and pure Roy Thomas. In Roy Thomas, in in Roy Thomas stories, the past will always save the present. It's it's a wonderful theme that runs through his writing. And one of the true believer issues uh, this time around was the first in, the first chapter of what later became known as the Kree Skrull War. It's this. It's Captain Marvel, the Kree Skrull War, True Believers, and uh, that it it says here featuring Captain Marvel, the, a man without a world. And you see there, you can you can't really tell from the cover. This has Sal Buscema artwork, uh, and it's it's uh, it's terrific. It's it's a fantastic issue, even though it makes very little sense at all. Uh, Captain Marvel is Marvel is completely ill defined. As a character, we don't know what he can and cannot do. At the first page of this issue, the first two pages of this issue, he fights the Avengers. He fights the Vision, Quicksilver, and the Scarlet Witch. <laughs> and Quicksilver charges him, and he swats him away like a bug. We're never told how Captain Marvel can even see Quicksilver moving, much less stop him. The, uh, uh, the Vision... He stops with one of those magic wristbands, even though we don't know we don't know where he got it. We don't know how it works. We don't know how it affects the vision. And he says to the Scarlet Witch that one of the prejudices that he's picked up on Earth is that he doesn't like to hit a female. So he flies away. <laughs> and he, he realizes that there's a bugboo in the story where he, real, he and Rick Jones realize there might be a chance to free him from the Phantom Zone forever. And of course, the the locus of that, the place where that will happen, will be in the Baxter building, the home of the Fantastic Four. So Captain Marvel walks in the front door, and a security guard says, well, I don't know who you are, and starts to pull his gun. Captain Marvel knocks him unconscious, goes outside, and then says, oh, yeah, that's right, I can fly. <laughs> that's a, and it's, it's ridiculous. We have seen this character punch people around left, right, and center, uh, but when he is trying to break into the penthouse of the Fantastic Four, he has trouble forcing open an elevator door. Although notice, see, notice the salvage game is great uh, craft work there. Look at that. The the tension builds in the three panels, then you get uh, the inspired movement of the one whole panel there. And notice how the, the motion is caught in the, the direction of the destroyed plant. It's very very dynamic. Uh, and the thing that you yeah, see, this is they're, they're advertising Captain Marvel, the new Captain Marvel on the on the back of these things. Because the Captain Marvel who is in the movie that is coming up. From the, in the latest installment in the Marvel Cinematic Universe is not Captain Marvel, <laughs> because Cap the other this was one of the ways I said there are two ways that Captain Marvel was bearable. The first way was when he he guest starred in the Kree Skrull War. The second way is when he died. <laughs> Jim Starlin, a great writer and artist, Jim Starlin got permission from Marvel Comics to kill Captain Marvel. Later on, he doesn't die in the Kree Skrull War, and he doesn't die in battle. He dies of cancer. An unbelievable thing it was done as one of Marvel's very earliest graphic novels. And it's terrific. The death of Captain Marvel is amazing. It is an amazing comic. Uh, kind of surprised that it's not a true believer. Maybe it's too big. And certainly they have a lucrative business reprinting it. Uh, I have like five different versions of it here in different collections. It is terrific. Uh, and then it's goodbye to Captain Marvel. <laughs> and you, So you might think, okay, well then the movie is about the next Captain Marvel, Monica Rambeau. Uh, a black woman who gains electromagnetic energy powers and takes on the name Captain Marvel because she was a captain in the Coast Guard. But no, <laughs> no, it's not her either, as you can see. It's Carol Danvers, who had a long history. She actually appears in the Kree Skrull War as a civilian, as, as just a, a, a military personnel. Uh, she, had, she had a long uh, history in Marvel Comics as a civilian character, a very good, solid grounding for a character. And years and years later... Uh, Stan Lee and a couple of other writers came up with the idea of giving Carol Danvers superpowers. Deri fairly derivative superpowers of Captain Marvel, making them linked somehow to the Kree and to Marvel. And they called her Ms. Marvel, MS period Marvel, and gave her a, a Captain Marvel derivative costume and some interesting powers and an interesting backstory. That issue, 
uh, that Ms. Marvel number one was, I think, a True Believers last week. I don't think I got it. Uh, but it had fantastic John Buscema artwork, and it had a great John Romita Sr. cover. Uh, and that is the the version of the character that we're getting in the new movie. Uh, but I got so I got this True Believers as a walk down memory lane. But of course, I had this originally, <laughs> and uh, you're going to see. It didn't look anything like this when I bought it for fifteen cents in 1971. You see, see the difference. In this, it's the Avengers explaining what they're doing up in that back corner. And it, the title starts off with the only good alien is a dead alien, <laughs> which of course is not here. <laughs> not just because they had to cram in the Kree Skrull War, but because it's a little bit indelicate in, in 2019. None of us in, 20, in 1971 ever thought we'd reach 2019. So it's, this is all terra incognita. Uh, this, this I got when it first came out, and uh, I loved it. And so, you know, I, I have, I had the original issue, but I thought I'd get the, the True Believers anyway. Uh, just to, to join the hype train, for the Captain Marvel movie, I'll be very interested in seeing what happens to it. Those of you who don't who don't frequent Reddit <laughs> or 8chan will not know the furor that exists in certain circles of uh, the online community, to put it in benign terms, and the alt right community, to name it for what it is, about this movie. the 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 alt right toxic fan community, if you want to call it that, they seem to hang together, but they hate this character. Carol Danvers, and they hate this version of Captain Marvel. And although they haven't explicitly stated it in too many places, they are clearly organizing to defeat this movie, to to make it so that it fails, so that it is a, mar a rare Marvel failure at the box office. And that's a big thing. That That's a very big thing. This weaponized extended community of the alt-right, one of whose facets is the, the movement called Comicscape that I've mentioned on Wednesday Comics before, that larger alt-right community tanked a Star Wars movie. They made, they made Solo, a Star Wars movie, fail at the box office. Now you can say all sorts of reasons. Certainly Disney has. They've said the, mar the movie-going audiences were saturated with Star Wars movies, that it was too soon after The Last Jedi, that... Uh, uh, the Han Solo, Harrison Ford still being alive meant that the character was sacred and that maybe people thought it was not the real Han Solo to have uh, a new person play him. Uh, one way, whether you believe any of that or not, I don't. I think the movie tanked because of this large, very large, uh, toxic fandom community that made it fail uh, by poisoning word of mouth on it for for the la the much larger group of the audience that would have gone to see it that is, doesn't know anything about comics and care anything about Star Wars. I think they're going to try and do the same thing with Captain Marvel, and I'd be willing to bet they succeed. I'd be willing to bet that the movie barely breaks even, which would be catastrophic for a number of reasons. <laughs> for a number of reasons. Not I don't I don't really care about the causiness of the thing, the, the female director, the female star, the first female, whatever you want to say. I don't really care about any of that. I care about having... Uh, a mob of bigots starting to dictate terms in Hollywood. That I would not like at all. Especially since... <sighs> not not to go down... We won't go on down this garden path because we have more comic stuff to talk about. But I, I want... I, it bears pointing out uh, that if this larger alt-right toxic fandom community is big enough and powerful enough and organized enough to tank a Star Wars movie, then it might be powerful enough to re-elect a president. And that has real-world implications. That's not just fanboying anymore. <laughs> so I'm watching the whole thing with keen interest. I wish I could report, as I did on this channel, when I when I had seen the screener for Wonder Woman, before I'd even seen the CGI. You may remember. <laughs> Some of you won't. Most of you won't, because I've made thousands of videos. But before I'd even seen the CGI, long before the movie came out in theaters, I told you, this is an incredible winner of a show. It's going to do fantastic. And uh, I was right. <laughs> and I said the same thing about Aquaman, if you remember correctly. I saw the screener for that as well. I've seen the screener for Captain Marvel, and I got none of the same feeling for it at all. It feels very by the numbers. And so was Ant-Man, and so was Ant-Man and the Wasp. But Ant-Man and Ant-Man and the Wasp, those two movies, they were by the numbers, but they had humor. And this tries and i don't know we'll see we'll see but anyway so this true believers 
was the first thing I got for Comics Wednesday. The second thing I got is also True Believers, uh, but it is a very different kind. This is this is about a True Believer. It's not a title called that. It's about a True Believer. It's a hardcover edition of the DC Universe by Len Wein. And it, it is an anthology of uh, a bunch of signature stories by this guy. <laughs> Uh, the the inscription here is 1948 to 2017. Writer, creator, editor, mentor, friend. Uh, Len Wein broke into comics when he was just a boy. And he was a true believer in every sense of the word. There was never a moment of his life from his mid-teens on when he didn't know with 100% certainty that he wanted to make a career in comic books. He wasn't always sure whether or not that would be drawing or writing them, uh, and it ended up that his writing was so visionary that his artists loved him anyway. He was, he was basically, in many cases, drawing comics. And it worked. He, he came on to uh, Marvel Comics right when Stan Lee was giving up the writing chores to people like uh, Len Wein and his friend Marv Wolfman and Roy Thomas before them. Uh, and he was a true believer in the best sense of the word, as you can tell from this cover. This is the DC Universe, because Len Wein went everywhere. <laughs> he did a ton of stuff for Marvel Comics, including creating some signature characters, like Wolverine and the new X-Men. Uh, but then he moved to DC and did a whole bunch of fun stuff, too. Uh, and uh, he was a true believer in the best sense of the word, because he was... He believed in comics, just heart and soul. So if a comic company, Marvel or DC or whoever, had one little backup feature in the middle of nowhere that they needed someone to write, he would do it with a smile on his face. If Marvel or DC gave him a very established character, someone like Superman or the Justice League, and said, here you go, uh, you have this character, but under no circumstances are you to introduce any changes. We want you to just come up with entertaining stories every month, and that's it. No Jor-El is still alive. No Superman has a baby. No blue-haired Superman. No, nothing like that. Just one good story after another. And he would do it. And also, if a company like Marvel or DC, more Marvel than DC, came to him and said, okay, here's an older comic. Here's an older property. We haven't been using it in years. See what you can do with it. You have permission to change it around. And boy, oh boy, could he do that. <laughs> and I haven't, I haven't really looked through this volume, uh, but uh, this is going to include just a ton of great stuff. Uh, I, saw, I looked at the table of contents, and there are four, three or four issues of The Phantom Stranger in here that when he was writing it with Jim Aparo at the absolute peak of his power as an artist, uh, as you can tell from the cover, that is Jim Starlin. Artwork, the aforementioned Jim Starlin, did a few issues of DC Presents, which was Superman's team-up comic. And Len Wein wrote those where Superman is introduced to the villain Mongol uh, and teams up with the Martian Manhunter. He teams up with Supergirl. Uh, he fights the Martian Manhunter and swats him into the ground like a bug. But then later he fights the Spectre, uh, a, a mainstay of the Justice Society of America from World War II, who is basically all-powerful and Superman never has a chance. And, and that's a wonderful thing to see in a Superman book. There, I think in this issue there are probably also a couple of issues of his, uh, his series of The Human Target, which was very successful. It was it was on TV. I think there were there was a TV series. I, I never have much patience with super with comic books that don't involve super powered characters. So I, I might I might just glance at those. Although I might maybe not. Maybe I'll read them just to to see the fun of them. Uh, and I'm, this also includes his uh, Justice League issues, where he had not only the Justice League and the Justice Society, but also the Seven Soldiers of Victory. Uh, this, in other words, this is going to bring back a lot of great memories, and these are going to be issues that I have these, for instance, these DC Presents issues in boxes here, and they're falling apart. I have those Phantom Stranger issues because they're so good, and now I don't have to worry about it. Now I can just, I can just uh, let them fall to dust or get rid of them. Uh, so this was the other True Believer that I got this week. I got an issue called True Believers, but I also got this thing because this is the reason that I get comics now. This is the kind of thing that I get at the comic shop, is beautiful anthologies like this that have, uh... Yeah, these... Okay, there are the Phantom Stranger issues. There's the Justice League, just issue after issue of the Justice League. Uh, I didn't really look too closely at the table of contents for this thing, although I am noticing, um... Uh, I am noticing that I thought the the write-up for this thing included uh, 
some issues of action comics that don't appear to be in here. So that maybe that maybe I got that wrong. Maybe that was a larger thing that it, that wasn't supposed to be in here in the first place. Uh, yeah, because there's there's no Superman in here. Uh, that's okay though, because those Justice League issues and Phantom Stranger alone are enough. Plus these DC presents, that's going to be wonderful. Uh, so that's it. That was my Comics Wednesday. Uh, I had a wonderful time, a wonderful visit. I met uh, a, a, an employee there I've never met before at Newberry Comics who was actually outgoing and helpful, <laughs> actually friendly and helpful. He was the only person there I met who was. The, the young woman who rang me up had, once again, I know I've said this before, it's not my imagination, though. She had a very visible look of personal contempt on her face while she rang me up. She clearly, personally hated dealing with me. <laughs> I have no idea why. <laughs> None whatsoever. I can guess. I can make some guesses. None of them reflect well on her. But this kid on the second floor who was in the comic section was outgoing, helpful, gave me his name and said I could feel free to contact him on the phone if I, if I have a question next Wednesday. I will test that out, see if it works. <laughs> That'd be nice. And uh, let that be a lesson to those of you who maybe work in retail. Uh, take a, a little page from my book when I worked in retail. That matters. <laughs> Though That personal connection matters. It, it can change whether or not you want to go back to a shop. <laughs> so, so anyway, that is uh, that is Comics Wednesday for now. It's mostly blast from the past. It's entirely blast from the past for me. I didn't see anything that I wanted to buy that was new. I doubt that I will unless... Well, actually, no. Next week is, I think, another issue of Conan. Uh, but in the meantime, I got these things and I'm as happy as a clam. So, so I, thought I'd, I thought I'd do that for Comic Book Wednesday. Uh, but I'll be back. We'll be back to talk about books. We have plenty of bookish stuff to talk about. Thank you, BookTube.